Okay, so good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the third lecture for uh, statistical models and methods. So, just a quick plug, you know, some quick logistics. So, how many of you have started the assignment, first assignment? How many of you have finished it? It's, uh, you know, it's not difficult. So, in case you're facing difficulty, definitely get in touch with the TAs uh, and myself. Okay, it's, it mostly requires using R. So I hope some of you attended the first uh, lab session. So you got at least, you know, you know, at least we started R and tried some commands. There's a very helpful, uh, especially in the IDE R Studio, which I don't think uh, the TA used. But in R Studio, you can actually look for help very easily, so you can understand what's going on. Okay. Would you, would it be possible if you could quickly discuss the first question? It's like yeah. It's like so much more difficult than the other questions. Uh, it's, I think the first question is a little bit open-ended, so I don't even... Okay, let me just uh, bring the question out. Okay, oh, okay, it's not here, so let me exercise 2.8. Yeah, so the first question is, uh, you know, compare the classification performance of linear regression and k-nearest neighbor, right? So that's a little bit open-ended. I hope everybody got access to the zip code data. It's, it's gzip, which is okay. I mean, I think some uh, operating systems don't support unzipping the gzip file, but I think I've provided the unzipped file. So you just read the, it's just a text file. You can open it in a text editor to see how it looks like. Okay. Uh, so, so here they're saying, you know, in particular, consider only the twos and the threes. So, zip code data is all about you have an uh, image, a 16 plus 16 image. Uh, so, so, so those many numbers. So, in, in the training data, let's focus on the training data. So, you have uh, the first number to be the digit itself uh, that is supposed to be represented by the 16 plus 16 image. So. So, so that's how the training data looks like, okay? And the training data actually has all the numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, you know, all the way to 9. Uh, here they're saying, let's just focus on the numbers 2 and 3. So out of the, I don't know how many rows there are in the training data, uh, you just kind of ignore other numbers and just focus on the uh, entries which correspond to 2 and 3, okay? 2 and what is the 16 plus 16, um, a representation uh, of the 16 plus 16 numbers which follow the 2 or the 3 okay, in your training data. Uh, and then this, they are asking, can you build a linear regression model uh, uh, as well as a k, you know, k nearest neighbor model. So, so this is actually very similar to the two dimensional examples that we went through in the class except the input features, sorry, the input uh, variable is not two dimensional, it's 16 times 16 dimensional, that's all. Um, the output is just two instead of oranges and blues. Uh, here it's um, the number two and the number three. But you know, uh, other than that, there is no distinction between the two dimensional example that we went through in the class and this this question. So, so do you have any particular question? As, as in, is something causing confusion here? Because the test data is so many people want to watch, right? No, test data. Uh, so I haven't seen it. So what? I think all data is uh, normalized between uh, minus one to one. That, that's okay. That's okay. I mean, so. Uh, actually, from that test of data, we will prove that it's actually the value to add uh, is uh, not so like uh, one machine. Yeah. So, okay, um, like, uh, it's more than like 16 or something. I'm saying it's uh, like. Uh, it's more than 16 than 16 numbers? Yeah. Uh, so, like, uh, so, we use the uh, degree, like, mixed value. Uh, actually, I, is it not able to, like, 
Okay, let me in real time try to at least open the. Uh, so you guys can see the. So tail, I don't know if it's tail, but so okay, I guess so. I'm just dumping a um, few uh, few lines, few last few lines of the data. But anyway, and you can open open this in the text editor as well. Actually, maybe I should. Um, So, okay. I mean, I should not edit this, but so this is this is your one observation, one row of your data, right? So the first number is just uh, telling you which digit it actually is, and these are supposed to be 16 times 16. I didn't verify, but those are the pixel entries. It's just that in real world, the pixel entries are between 0 to 255. I think uh, Ping pointed that out. I don't know where she is. Uh, but the but they have just normalized the data, which means that they they just Divided, uh, they just rescale the data. That's all. Uh, so these numbers are supposed to like uh, correspond to a 16 cross 16 matrix. If you can plot this matrix, you'll actually see the number potentially. Um, so, so you are supposed to see the number nine. Is is that so? So this data and the training data are exactly the same format. The first number corresponds to the digit, and the remaining 16 times 16 correspond to uh, the pixel entries, which are normalized between zero to, uh, sorry, normalized between minus one to one. Um, any any confusion here? Mm -hmm. So basically, I only need to look at the data that starts with three and starts with two. Uh, you so yeah te so test data you need to know what is the real number right so w what was the down truth uh, realization of the output variable here it's nine mm -hmm. so that will be needed when you kind of uh, get an estimate of your performance of your uh, classifier or, or, or regression function right not regression function but if you use linear regression you you will make a prediction for whether it's a two or a three. Right, so when you make the prediction whether it's a two or a three, then you want to compare with what it actually was, whether it was a two or a three, right? Um, any any confusion? So is everybody confused or just you? Because uh, it's important. <laughs> <laughs> so so there's basically no difference between test and training data. The test data is just for you to, so with training data you build a k nearest neighbor, let's say you just pick three, let's say, you know, you, you want to build a classifier, so KNN really doesn't require any modeling, you just pick a number, k, right, once you pick the number, you that is your classifier, okay, so okay, if you pick k is equal to three, then uh, for every test point, so this is going to be your test point, this whole 16 times 16 uh, dimensional vector, so uh, try to find the nearest three points in this 16 times 16 dimensional space, okay, and then look at their uh, uh, labels in the test data, which would be nine or one or two. You may want to get rid of all the other numbers other than twos and threes in your training data, and then if twos there are two twos and one three, then your prediction is two, right? That's what happens in k nearest neighbor. Maybe we'll talk about test and train again, actually, in, in this class, so it may clarify some things. But, but uh, see, the only, I guess, difference from the example that we went through in the class is this, this is 16 times 16. Uh, in the class, it was two-dimensional. Okay. <coughs> so if, 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 you have, if, you, if you got a data set which was related to the class data set, you know, the, the example that you saw in the class, it would, it would have in each row just three entries. One would say orange or blue. Let's say orange is encoded as one and blue is encoded as zero. <laughs> then it would be one and then two other numbers. Instead of two other numbers here, there are 16 times 16 numbers. Okay, I, uh, I think we should move forward. Uh, but if, if, if some of you are still confused, then uh, let's, you know, talk again during the break or after the class. Okay. Um, I open too many things. Okay, let's go back.
Okay, so today we're gonna uh, touch. Uh, you know, we will try to attack the question of how do you choose k, right? In in the k nearest neighbor problem, or uh, uh, there are some other parameters that happen in linear regression as well. And today we're gonna look at some extensions of linear regression. So if you remember, uh, in the last class we looked at uh, uh, linear regression, and we had a closed form expression for. Uh, uh, the linear regression uh, estimate, right? Beta hat was just, uh, you know, the matrix X transpose matrix X uh, inverse uh, the matrix X transpose uh, the vector version of uh, Y. So, so Y was uh, n n times one, and uh, this whole thing uh, is P times n. This whole the product of these three matrices in whatever transformations they have. Uh, and so you had a three-dimensional estimate of beta hat, right? So here, really, there is no parameter that you're choosing, right? Uh, the right-hand side is completely, is just your data. The X matrix and the Y vector, which are realizations of uh, these input and output variables in your training data, are just data. So there is nothing to tune here, OK? Uh, but we will see some extensions of uh, linear regression today where there is something to tune. Just like in the k-nearest neighbor, there is something to pick, right? The k has to be picked that you need to choose. Um, okay. So, so that brings uh, uh, us to the topic of bias, variance, trade-off. Um, bias variance trade off by itself will not tell you how to pick k but it will pick, tell you what is the impact of picking some k okay uh, the choice of k we will see how to pick uh, maybe in the second half of this this class okay um, so let's let's recall uh, uh, let's recall what does knn do so knn makes a prediction let's say we want to make it okay i'm going to make some assumptions to uh, describe this concept of bias and variance, right? So, so what is what is the assumption? Let's assume that y. So, so okay. Let me start with the case. You know, k nearest neighbor. Okay, and let you know. Uh, I need to assume something about the joint distribution of uh, x and y, which is this uh, p r of x and y that I had introduced la in the last lecture. I'm going to, when we talk about bias and variance, these are statistical concepts, which means that they are defined in terms of some joint distribution. So that's why I want to introduce first, uh, what is that joint distribution? Let me fix that to be an example of joint distribution. And then I'm going to describe what is bias and what is variance. Okay. Um, So, so how, what is this description? It's going to be that y is going to be a function of x plus uh, epsilon. Okay. Where I'm just going to assume that uh, x is not random and epsilon is a random variable. So let's say y is uh, one dimensional and x is p dimensional. Okay. And so of course epsilon has to be one dimensional, right? Because the output variable is one dimensional. Um, so let's say epsilon is a random variable such that the expectation of uh, epsilon is zero and uh, variance of epsilon which I'm going to describe where exactly it is. It's going to be the expectation of epsilon minus the expectation of epsilon. Square. Okay. I'm just going to assume this to be sigma square. Okay. So, does everybody recall what is meant by uh, expectation at least? I think I, I expanded the definition of expectation last time. Uh, variance is again uh, defined with respect to the distribution of the random variable. So, so if it's a random variable, it will have some uh, distribution function associated with it, right? like a density function. Uh, right? Like for example, it's a normal distribution. right? 
then this expectation is res with respect to the probability of what values epsilon takes. Right? Um, and variance is just uh, how does the random variable vary uh, from from its expected value? Okay, in in this sense, in a squared sense, that's just the definition of variance for one-dimensional uh, scalar random variable. Okay. Um, so so notice that I did not define a joint distribution on x and y really, because if you think of a joint distribution on x and y, it says how does how does x and y x and y are supposed to be random variables and both of them co-vary in some way. For example, they can be independent or they can be dependent in some way. Here I'm just saying that x is not random at all. So what is random in this equation? The only thing random is epsilon. Okay. So for every x, y is just a random variable that takes a fixed value, okay, f of x, and then uh, um, that value is perturbed by a random variable x, epsilon. Perturbed as in, in it's added, you add a random variable epsilon to it, therefore y is also a random variable. Okay. So this is a sim very simple model. So in general, like I, when I want to introduce the concept of bias and variance, just to understand what KNN and regression are doing, uh, I don't want to deal with a really complicated joint distribution of x and y because that won't give me any intuition of what's happening. Okay, so that's why I said, okay, let me fix x to be non-random, and just the only source of randomness, or uh, you know, uh, only source of randomness is through an additive <coughs> error, uh, additive uh, number, which is which is random. Okay, and I don't even need to know what it's that additive number, which is a random variable. Its distribution is all I need to know is that uh, what its expectation is and what its variance is. Okay. If I knew the distribution, I can tell what the expectation of the variance is. But I don't even need to say anything about the distribution. I just want to know what its uh, what its uh, expectation of variance are. Okay. For example, if it's a normally distributed random variable, you can think of example epsilon as normal with zero mean and variance sigma square. This fits this description, right? The expectation is zero and the variance is sigma square. Okay. So for that, okay. so for that model of data, so let's assume that is the way data gets generated. That for any given x, I have a unknown function f. Uh, you take the f of x value and you add some random variable to it, and that's how y gets observed. You know, y gets realized. Okay. So, so that's the model of the data. Uh, for that data, let's look at. Uh, Expected square probability of error. Okay, if you remember EPE uh, from the previous class, um, EPE was defined. I think uh, okay. I'm going to slightly change the notation for EPE. I'm just going to say, okay, I know expected prediction, ex expected square prediction error. So uh, I think I, I use this notation. So I said expectation uh, of y minus. Um, for any function, okay, let me call this function as f1 instead of you know, like that. This this is the definition of EPE, right? So, so you know, instead of uh, okay, I should I should write probability of x and y. Okay, okay. this was uh, I'm just repeating what we did last time. This was the definition of expected square prediction error. Okay, now I'm going to slightly abuse notation. I mean, this is I guess standard. Uh, we will call EPE at a test point x now. Okay. Um, at a test point x not. Uh, in the notes, I kind of. Uh, Okay, so this is going to be different from slightly different from this in the sense that I'm going to look at a particular test point x naught, and I'm going to use a KNN uh, uh, a KNN model. Okay, so those are the two changes. So in the EP definition, there is no so for every fixed uh, uh, sorry, for every model, this is a score that you can get if you knew the true distribution. Like if I know the true distribution, give me any model, I can give you the give you a number for that model. That f is a model here. So I'm going to fix the model to be KNN, 
and I'm going to ask, just tell me how the KNN performs for a given x naught. Okay. So, so that is going to be uh, because uh, now KNN is a uh, so instead of f1, I'm going to substitute it as a KNN model. I'm going to denote it as f hat. Okay. Hats generally are used for things which are derived from data. So remember, we were using beta hat. Uh, for least squares uh, solution as we call it a function of uh, data right um, so I'm going to just call the KNN model f hat and what f hat really is um, uh, okay so let me let me fill this here uh, so let me take an aside uh, f hat at an, an, at a, let's say a test point x naught so KNN is just going to be tell me what are the k nearest guys right Let's call the L closest point x subscript uh, x subscript bracket L. So so this is just the uh, you know definition of K L K N N. I'm just saying that if you if you're given a test point, you know take k points, you know these let me call these k points L you know x subscript one uh, to x subscript L to x subscript k. I'm putting a square bracket because I'm just going to order all the points in my training data uh, in terms of how closest these are to x naught and take the k closest ones. Okay. And then I'm just gonna, I mean, I'm just gonna average the uh, y's corresponding to those x's, right? That's what I've written. Um, okay. So we will uh, now uh, okay. we, will, we will substitute f hat into the EP definition that I'm gonna write now, which is as follows. Okay. Is going to be expectation. Or so, if you remember, if it is an expectation of joint distribution of x and y, here x is not random and y is only random because epsilon is random. So I'm going to substitute epsilon here. Okay. And oh, there's a typo on the mouse. There's a square missing in that expression. Uh, and I'm going to use a Another symbol tau, okay. I'm mean, it's a shorthand for something, I'm gonna just describe it now. Uh, of y minus f hat of uh, x naught square. Okay. And uh, okay, I've just written condition on x is equal to x naught. Yeah, so so how is this definition slightly different from uh, what we saw earlier? Is that so the if you look at the subscript of the EP definition, there was a probability of x x x y right. So instead of that, I substituted epsilon because epsilon is the only random variable in the description of the how the input variable is related to the output, output variable. And I use a new notation tau, and that's because I substituted uh, I substituted something which is dependent on the training data okay training data which are realizations of uh, remember training data was you know we always use xi comma yi uh, where i is from 1 to let's say n these are the realizations of the input and output variables uh, i'm just gonna you know so training data this is also called a sample okay given the training data i have a i have a prediction model here the KNN model because 
if you remember KNN at any given point, if you look at the top part of this page, uh, is, is dependent on the training data, right? It, first you need to compute the closest training points to your query point, uh, to your test point, and then take the wise of the training data. So it is a function of the training data, right? It depends on the training data is what I mean. Uh, now, so what I'm saying is f hat is a function of the training data. We are now going to think of, uh, so we're just going to hypothesize that, okay, since f hat is a function of training data, it can be random in the sense that if my training data changes, then f hat also changes. Okay? And that's why I introduced the notation tau as a shorthand for uh, training data. Okay? So, the other way to think about this is uh, very straightforward. All I'm saying is, uh, I want to have expected square prediction error at a new point. I'm going to ground that point to be x0. Okay, at x0, the only randomness in my x and y is just epsilon, right? Because uh, y was equal to f of x plus uh, epsilon. So epsilon is the only random thing. Uh, x0 is fixed, okay? Uh, so that corresponds to the first subscript, epsilon. The second subscript corresponds to f, f hat, because f hat depends on training data. And now I'm going to take expectation with respect to the training data itself, okay? which is a new concept here, uh, which we did not see last time. Um, so, yeah, if, if x0 is fixed, the only randomness in the, so, so think of it this way, right? I have the training data and I have a test point, uh, okay? Uh, so in EPE, actually let me take an aside, so in EPE definition, for any fixed function, okay, here function is fixed, okay, it's not dependent on data. So for, let's fix a function which maps input to output, okay, it could be a bad function, it could be a good function. Uh, EP for a fixed f, f uh, will take expectation over the random variables x and y of, uh, you know, y minus f of x square, okay. Here x and y are random. Now I can always define EP in two, two stages, I can relate it to the first one, which is I can say, okay, let me fix a function, but now I want to fix the input to be some fixed test point, then you can't take an expectation over that, right, because that test point is gone. I mean, it's not random anymore. I said it's going to be x0. So then you have to take an expectation over, you know, probability of, uh, expectation over whatever re remaining randomness is, which is probability of y given x is equal to x0, okay? Like I removed the randomness, so you need to just retain the remaining randomness, uh, which is just this. And it happens to be this is ex exactly uh, you know distributed as epsilon in my model. So that's why there is an epsilon there. Um, so it's the same definition again. So it will be uh, y minus f1, I guess it's f1, of x0 square. Okay, that's uh, that's 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 the definition of EP. If I if I have a fixed model f1 that is known a priori that doesn't depend on training data and uh, I want to query at an x0. Okay. Now we are saying okay, uh, actually this f1 model I'm actually going to pick it using my data either through linear, linear regression or using KNN. So it's based on it's a function of training data, right? And think of in this in, in the statistical or uh, uh, the probability setting training data. You know, maybe so we assume that training data is generated, you know, by drawing from this joint distribution P of x comma y, right? If you redraw the same n, uh, you know, same size training data, it will not probably be the same as the original training data, right? So if you, what I'm saying is, let's say I, I draw x i y i, which are realizations actually, uh, are drawn from P of x comma y n times, okay? That would be one training data, one realization of data from this joint distribution, right? If you, if, for example, if you draw a number from uh, a random, you know, a Gaussian random, a Gaussian random variable, if you draw a realization of a Gaussian random variable, if two numbers will not be the same, right? Let's say I draw 10 numbers from a Gaussian random variable, and again, next again, draw another 10 numbers from a Gaussian random variable, those, not, those sequences of numbers will not be the same, right? That's what I mean by, uh, so that's, that's what I mean by, uh, uh, that's why I introduce, uh, uh, another uh, okay. Well, 
let me just write that x x prime y i prime let's say another set of training data which is n n primes so this is different from this typically okay uh, and so i'm going to take an expectation over the variation here and that variation is uh, is basically captured as a uh, by, by representing a star okay uh, is that confusing or is that how many of you are confused at this point uh, so you, you f you're fine with the EP definition, right? It was taking expectation over just two random variables. One was the input random variable and the other is the output random variable, right? So one first change from the previous definition of EP was that I'm going to condition now. It's actually, I'm going to fix x to be x now, okay? Then x is not random anymore. The only thing which can be random is the other random variable, which is y, right? So that's the first reduction. Uh, that if I fix x to be something, so originally the, uh, in the EP definition, x and y are random variables. I'm going to fix x to be x naught. Okay. Then it gives me. Uh, so forget about it now. It gives me a definition of actually here. Uh, yeah, this 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 part here is saying I'm going to fix the test point to be a fixed value x naught. Okay. Then the only randomness is y, and therefore, you know, I just uh, substitute the expectation with just a randomness in y. Okay. Uh, when you when you condition a random variable in a joint distribution, you have to look at the conditional distribution of the remaining random variable given the realization of the random variable that has realized. Okay. So so like at the beginning of time, you don't know. So both x and y are random variables. Let's say x was uh, you want to fix x to be x naught. Then the remaining randomness in in this joint distribution is only the conditional distribution of y given x naught. Okay, that's just uh, uh, yeah. Why are we Yeah, we just want some realization of a, uh, of a test data. So X naught, I didn't say it's training data, right? X naught is a test data. Uh, so, so can you uh, repeat your question, actually? Uh, I don't know that uh, tau represents uh, the data set from the training data. Yeah, tau represents the randomness in the training data. So think of uh, tau being uh, like just with, uh, you know, so I guess they use, uh, uh, I'm using short notation tau, which may be confusing people. So tau is actually just, if you really want to think of it this way, it's probability of x, x, capital X1, capital Y1, which are the random variables corresponding to the realizations little x1 and little y1. Because little x1 and little y1 are realizations from the joint distribution. So let me just call the corresponding random variables capital X1, capital Y1, times probability of capital X2, capital Y2, times you know, probability of capital X n, capital Y n, where I'm just using, so I, I haven't used this notation elsewhere. I don't want to use this because it's just going to, you know, be more notation. But tau is just this joint distribution of all the n pairs of your training data. So your training data, data has n pairs, little xi, little yi, right? Just think of them, little xi, little yi, as the realizations of capital XI, capital YI, which are random variables, right? And of course, if they're random variables, they're, they're determined by the joint distribution P subscript XI, YI, yeah. A realization is just, uh, you know, if, if, for example, if you are, for example, let's say Z is binomial with some bias, you know, 0 0.5. This just means that it it just means that I have a coin which is unbiased in the sense that it can land heads and tails equally. And if it's heads, let's say Z takes a value 1. If it's tails, let's say Z takes a value 0. Then Z is a random variable. Right? So the realization of the random variable is what happened. So little z, so maybe I flip this coin 10 times. Then I'll get little z1, little z2, uh, to let's say z, little z10. Maybe this one takes a value 1, which means maybe head happened. This one takes a value maybe zero, maybe tails happen and so on. So this this sequence uh, is called a realization, uh, 10 realizations of this, this random variable z. Okay. Similarly, your training data is n realizations, n, you know, let's say 100 or whatever thousand, realizations of 
these random variables which we assume to be the same. So in every every ith realization, it's from the same distribution that I'm just realizing uh, the values of x i y y. So that's why I just multiplied. So actually, this is in fact p of x y to the power n. This is the product of uh, this giant distribution to the power n. Okay. But all you need to uh, understand is the two changes which happened from uh, the definition of E p. The first change was I fixed x naught. So think of the testing side. Instead of x and y being a random variable, I said let me fix x naught. Okay. Then the only randomness is y. And it so happens in my model that the y is just a function of, uh, it's just a linear function of epsilon, which is only random variable. So that's why I wrote a substrate epsilon. Okay. The second change which is happening is, I just made the f, okay, in EP definition, what is this f? It, that f was not a function of your training data yet. Okay, I, I said for any function which relates input to output, I can define an EP which is a number that I can associate with that function, right? Now I'm making that function a function of the training data, okay? So I made it a function of training data, that's fine. But I want to look at the statistics of it and therefore I'm taking additional expectation over the randomness in the training data. Which means that if I get one training data, which is n realizations of XI, y, that's one realization of the training data. I can again call the same, you know, call this from the same joint distribution another training data. So I, I need to take expectation of a different training data itself. Okay. Just to bring statistics of the training data into the picture as well. Okay. So as a rule of thumb, all I'm saying is uh, where is it? Okay. Yeah, this EP definition. These two expectations are taking care of randomness in the test data, remaining randomness in the test data. Once, you know, test data is supposed to be one pair of test data is x, y. Let's say x takes a value x naught. Then the only remaining randomness in the testing point is uh, y, right? Y is potentially, you know, uh, plus or minus, uh, sorry, y is the only randomness. And then the second expectation is taking care of the randomness in the training data. That's why there's a epsilon and a tau. Um, so this is kind of important to describe what is meant by. So when we talk about bias, and so let's let's think of variance because we kind of understand variance, right? Variance is I just wrote the definition of variance uh, in the first page. So variance is a function of uh, a distribution, right? If you know the distribution, you can talk about variance of a random variable. For example, Bernoulli, you know, if it's a fair coin here, you can compute, you know, actually it doesn't go that way, but you can compute expectation of z. For a Bernoulli random variable, expectation of z is just same as the parameter 0.5. And, it, and variance of z, and I wrote the definition earlier, is just going to be, it so happens to be, I mean, I'm just going to just recall from my memory that it's going to be uh, the parameter times 1 minus the parameter. Okay. And this happens to be 0 0.25. So what I'm saying is variance is a function of uh, the distribution, okay? And so we want to think about the variance of my model, okay? The model is a function of training data. And so I'm going to think of the variance of the model using the distribution of the training data. And that's this, this long distribution I just shorthanded it to tau. Let's think about this a little bit more because uh, when you switch from model 1 to model 2, let's say tomorrow you want to use a linear regression, the day after tomorrow you want to use support vector regression, you know, a random, random, you know, new, new methods, they all kind of, you, you need to understand what's happening with the bias of that model and the variance of that model. Okay. And when you talk about bias and variance of models, uh, models are functions of training data. So when you talk about variance of a model, it's all about variance over the distribution over the training data. Okay. Otherwise, you can't. So bias and variances are only defined for things which are random, right? Your model is random because the next day, maybe you regenerate your training data, it can be a different data, right? That's why I use x uh, x x i y i here, and then x i x i prime y i prime here, which could be a different data, like right from the same distribution. So okay, so that was just uh, aside on the definition of EP. If you are comfortable with yes, yeah. Is it variance 
then consider it will be a testing error. Because we uh -huh. consider bias to be the training error, you know. Uh, we tend to, you know, increase bias in order to get a lower variance score. So how is it like, related to yeah. training data? Variance, how is it related to training data? Yes, we will discuss that. So, uh, in the first lecture, I suggested you forget everything that you learned outside this class. Here, we're going to actually understand. Uh, so, if you remember from the last class, EP was actually the number that you can associate for any model, right? Because EP, see, think about statistical modeling. Uh, if you ha you have two things, two scenarios, you have data or you have the joint distribution. If you have the joint distribution, you can score every model and figure out which model makes the, you know, maps the input to the output variables, okay? That's, that's a scenario which we don't have. You know, we don't have access to joint distribution. But if we have joint distribution, we can score every model, so there is no notion of test and train, you know, it's just every, every model I can give a number to that. Now, the second scenario is that I don't have a joint distribution, I have data, okay? Now I want to score models, like models that I build, let's say a KNN model or a linear regression model. Uh, the scoring would be using something called, you know, a test estimate of the EPE. Uh, I think last time I, I kind of alluded to EPE is being approximated uh, by by uh, empirical values, like the least squares is an approximate of the EPE, right? So, so, so in this line, you only have training data, and uh, test errors are computed using using data. So, uh, we will get to what is the relation between these estimates of error? These errors are supposed to estimate EPE, by the way. How are these error, estimates of error related to variance? We will discuss soon. So let's not confuse variance of a model with uh, error estimate of a model. Not yet. <laughs> Don't get confused. Yeah. We, will, we will discuss uh, what is variance and how it's related to uh, error soon. Okay. Uh, So, so I guess uh, now probably you guys must have forgotten. I I fix my uh, joint distribution to be uh, or my data to be exactly in this form, which is that there is some unknown f which maps an x to a y. X is not random. Y just happens to be you know uh, y just happens to be an additive form like this, where uh, given an x, you transform the x to a number. And then you add uh, the realization of a random variable, and that gives you a y. Okay, that's what, that's a specific example model that I want to consider to describe what, what is bias and what is variance. Okay, uh, for that model, let's just uh, write down the uh, EP. Uh, the EP just I defined just now at a point x naught is going to be expectation over epsilon and uh, and tau. So tau is my randomness on training data of uh, y minus f hat of x naught. Okay. Square. Okay, I'm dropping the condition on x is equal to x naught because we fix x naught, little x naught. Is is this definition of e, uh, AP clear or somewhat okay? You know, there's only two randomness. F hat depends on tau and y depends on epsilon. Okay. If you wanna, really want to think about why is there subscript two subscripts? You know, F hat is random because of training data can be random, and Y is random because I'm assuming a data model which is you know X and Y are X is not random but Y is random because of epsilon. Now I can so now I'm going to just do a simple trick to kind of define what is bias, define what is variance, which is as follows. Let me add and subtract. So let, let me just consider the term inside. Okay, so it's Y minus F hat of x naught square plus a term inside the expectation operation, right? So that term is, I'm going to just add and subtract two things. I'm going to do y minus uh, Okay, let me just uh, name the term later. Let me just put minus c plus c uh, minus f hat of x naught. Okay, I can always do this, right? This is the same as the left hand side. There is nothing changing here. Okay. And then I'm gonna just expand these squares. Okay. So I'm gonna say y minus c square plus c minus f hat 
x map square these are all scalar so one dimensional thing so it's just a, a minus b the whole square or a plus b the whole square ok actually yeah This is fine, right? Now I'm gonna set C. So I just said this is true for any C. So I'm gonna set the C number to be expectation over tau of f hat of x naught. Okay. So what does this mean? All I'm saying is for every different realization of my training data, I can get a different potentially different model, right? Uh, so I'm gonna take the average of all these models. At, you know whatever they're predicting at x naught. Okay. Just to you know drive home the point. Let's say we are in the two D case. It so happened that uh, in the first uh, realization of my data points, there's two zeros here, two x's here. Maybe oranges and blues. Okay. And so these are my four data points. Okay. So that would be one realization from the tau. Uh, you know, uh, one realization of my training data. And maybe in the second realization of training data, maybe zeros are like this and x's are like this. Okay, so this is another realization of training data. Similarly, there could be many. I'm going to average that. That average is being represented here. So it's all the same concept. Okay. F hat depends on training data. Training data can be different every time. So I'm going to average the randomness over the training data. That's how. That's how this is doing. This is kind of important, so let's really clear our doubts here. So, anybody still confused about why there is two subscripts here? Let's let's see, you know, not tell you. Yeah. So it's the average. So the first part was uh, for any C, this is true, right? I mean, this, I just added and subtracted. Yeah. Now I'm saying let's pick C to be something, and uh, yeah, you're beginning to kind of describe it. It's the average of the predictions made by f hat. f hat is a function of my training data. Training data is random. So f hat being a function of training data is also random. And therefore, I'm going to take an expectation of this random object or, or random variable over whatever it is, you know, whatever is the distribution governing the random variable. So, so, if, so an example of how to think about it is, you know, I have some, let's say I have random variables w1, w2, and w3. Okay, and I have a random variable z, which is a function of these three random variables. Okay, so, uh, let me not use this stuff here. Okay, so let's say there are three random variables w1, w2, w3, and z is a function of that random variable. Then then I can talk about you know, I can of course talk about ex expectation of W1 and so on because these are random variables. I can also talk about expectation of Z because that's a function of random variable. Okay? So that's all that's happening. So my F hat, oh my god. My F hat is a function of my training data. I'm going to consider my training data to be random variables now. Okay? For example, uh, I'll just give an example here, right? So in one, one realization of any training data, these are the x points. Uh, let's say two-dimensional training data. Remember the oranges and blues example. Maybe this is how the x points realize. Uh, maybe in second realization of training data, uh, maybe this is how the x points realize. I need to average over all, you know, realizations like that of my training data. That is being captured by this tau. So f is just a function of the training data. Training data is random. So I need to take expectation of the f hat as well. You didn't have to think about this when you, like when, when you actually build a model, you don't think about this, but this is needed to understand the properties of the model. Okay? You build a KNN model with k is equal to 3, how do you know k is, k is equal to 3 is a good, good idea? Why not k is equal to 10 or 100, right? So to understand that, we ground ourselves in the probabilistic setting. We introduce joint distributions of x and y. Uh, training data is also a product of these joint distributions, right? Uh, because each x i y i is realization from the same joint distribution p of x comma y, right? Um, 
so that's shorthand notation tau here I use the yeah it's just a, each x and y is, is a realization from a joint distribution and I just shorthand it with tau okay again still who is not clear on this or who is like really bored to death I mean understands this I mean who understands this let's ask this question <laughs> okay so what's the confusing aspect here? Uh, so what's confusing here? I think it's just hard to understand without like, the practical example. No, I mean, so the practical side is given, so you will not have many realizations of training data, right? You will have one realization of training data from which you constructed a model, like a KNN model, like a KNN model or a linear regression. That's just a one realization of training data. But you want to understand the statistics of your model. To understand the statistics of, of your model, you need, you, you need to hypothesize that uh, what if I had different, different, many different versions or copies of training data, but they're not copies. They are realizations from some data generative process that gave me this training data. And then you're asking for the statistics of the model. So uh, in practice, you will not think about statistics of the model. You only you you will give you given one sequence, or one realization training data from which you will construct the model. So, so this is to just understand the choice of K and so on. Like in the KNN, you need to pick K. In linear regression, you are not picking anything right now, but we will see in the you know in the next half of the class, you will pick something. And so, how do you pick that? You you kind of appreciate that if you understand the statistics of the model. Uh, okay, so. Yeah, so, so first, so there are two steps to understand this. First thing is to understand that f hat is a function of training data, right? Now all I'm trying to change is that, uh, so first step is to understand f hat is a function of training data. Second step is to understand that training data itself can be a random object. And therefore f hat, which is a function of the training data, is also a random object. And so I'm going to take an average of that. I'm just, this is definition, I'm just going to take an average of uh, the, that random object. Okay. F hat is a random variable, for example, if it's a, let's say it's a random variable, then you just take an average of it, right? To remove the randomness, that's what I'm doing here. Yeah. I mean, so this quantity is the expected uh, prediction you would make, where the expectation is that all training data that you could have seen. Okay. Like, let's say in some you know, alternate where you would have many, 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 many different training data, tra training data, you would compute different f hats potentially because f hats depend on training data. Then you take the average of all these f hats at a given fixed test point, x naught, and that would be this number c. Yeah, it does, it does. No, all models will construct are going to be derived, I mean, unless you are building a model like just based on your knowledge, domain knowledge, all models are going to be dependent on data, which is in this case training data, or the data, or the realizations, the input and output variables that you have. We can discuss that later if needed, okay? Okay, so the reason I spent a lot of time on this actually is to define what is bias and variance. So I just chose C and, uh, and uh, Yeah, so if I got, come back to this expression here, I'm going to just uh, start from here again, okay? So, uh, I split it into, uh, into two terms, uh, three terms, right? So let me call it term 1 plus term 2 plus term 3 because I introduced the C in between, right? So there were three, three terms in the expansion of the square, right? This one, this one, and this one. Here I'm not taking expectation, but I'm going to take the expectation soon, okay? 
So let's let me just rewrite what term one is. Term one was the expectation over epsilon and tau of y minus uh, expectation over tau of f hat f x naught right square. I mean, I just tacked on this expectation from before because the first time uh, I just substituted the value of uh, c here, right? Yeah, I guess I, yeah. That's the first term, right? And uh, term two, uh, again, uh, is the expectation of So if you look at term two, it doesn't depend on y at all. Okay, it's only if c is anyway is 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 a constant, and uh, and this term doesn't depend on y. Uh, you know, there is no random variable y, so I can remove the subscript epsilon uh, there. So I can just write epsilon. Oh, sorry, as tau of uh, yeah. Term three. Uh, what is term three? There is a two times something, right? So there is a y here. There is an f hat here. So okay. Of, uh, two times y minus. Let me just put c there. Doesn't matter. Um, So this term two is called the variance of your model. Okay. Why? Why is that a variance? Because see here, your model is, looks like a random variable. You've taken its expectation, and you're taking expectation. So you have you have removed the mean from that random variable roughly taken a square and you're taking expectation. That's why it's called a variance. Okay. But what is the expectation over? The expectation is over the randomness in the training data. Okay. So now we are tacked on a variance interpretation to your model. Okay. Because the model is a function of the training data. This term, first term actually, is just a function of epsilon because I have removed the randomness due to the due to the second object tau, right? This is not a function. This is not a function of tau anymore. Neither is y a function of tau. So you only need to take expectation with respect to the thing which is random. So there's epsilon there. So Okay, now actually to simplify this further, to define what is bias, I'm gonna now recollect our model from before. So our model was y is equal to f of x, 
for some f, f some unknown f plus epsilon where epsilon is uh, the valence of epsilon is sigma square right so so if I substitute so let's let's imagine for a second that I can substitute uh, instead of y I can substitute f of x minus f, f of x plus epsilon there because y is just f of x plus epsilon uh, then uh, yeah then so okay this term at, uh, I don't know okay so term 1 uh, I'm going to substitute y is equal to uh, f of x plus epsilon and then there's a minus I guess uh, c term there right uh, the whole square there's an expectation over epsilon right now I can expand this term again okay second expansion of a square uh, where one of the first terms is going to be epsilon and the second term is going to be f of x minus c that's going to be epsilon square expectation of epsilon square I'm just going to copy that uh, plus expectation of 2 times epsilon times f of x minus c right uh, you remember it's just a, a minus b uh, sorry a plus b whole square expansion plus expectation of uh, epsilon of f of x minus c the whole square but this part is not a function of epsilon anymore so you can delete this guy expectation of epsilon is 0 by assumption in my model right and variance of epsilon is sigma square ok so this part is not uh, you know doesn't depend on epsilon this part is called the bias of um, bias of the model ok the c is a function of is the expectation of f hat right so how is the expectation of f hat far away from uh, f of x itself is, is called the bias of the model ok yeah no there is no f hat right so I am substituting y is equal to fx plus c uh, sorry fx plus epsilon the true model ok so this is a true model this is your expected model ok uh, actually yeah actually let me substitute x naught here yeah the true model is f of true uh, model uh, is uh, corresponds to f of x naught and C is your expectation of your predicted model, right? Uh, or the prediction model. So this part is called the bias of the model. And why is it called a bias? Because it's it's asking how far is your expected predicted prediction model? Because C, if you remember, is expectation of f hat. How far is it from the true functional relationship f of x naught? Okay. The true relationship between x and y was characterized by this function f. Okay. And we are suggesting f hat which is a random thing so we took its expectation because in C there is an expectation of a power or the, or the randomness we are just asking how far are these two ok ideally if your f hat uh, you know you can imagine a situation where f hat uh, if you take the expectation of all your training data is exactly equal to f of x naught that means that it's, uh, it's an unbiased model and uh, this term is going to be zero ok so, so why is it called a bias because Ideally, f of x naught should be equal to expectation of tau of f of f hat of x naught. Okay. Um, what I mean is, f hat of x naught. This is the expected model prediction. It should be ideally close to f of x naught, which is where f is the unknown true relationship between input and output variables. So. Yeah, so the difference between these two is called is just defined to be the bias of your modeling procedure. So, because a fact every time if it's the NN modeling procedure, then you get different f hats depending on training data, right? You take the average of all these f hats predictions at x naught, they should be close to f of x naught. You know, uh, otherwise you are even averaging your all training data samples, you are not guessing you are off. Your average uh, estimate is off from the true value of, of x naught. Then you have a bias and the term oh, is the term? and the term 2 
is just asking for a variance of a random variable. It just looks like the formula for a variance of a random variable, right? So it's called the variance of your estimator. Okay. The other terms, uh, let's discuss them uh, after the break. Uh, the other terms just cancel out to be zero. Okay. It just happens in this model they can cancel out to be zero. So we we only just focus on bias and variance. Okay. And now we can think of why did we choose k? Uh, we can compute, uh, compute these bias and variance values for a fixed k and then we can talk about how does k influence bias or how does k influence variance of your estimation. Okay. Let's take a small break. I think a lot of you got confused why I took a long time for explaining this. Uh, but if you have any questions, just see me right now. Okay. Let's take a 10 minute break. So we just change the subscript probability of x comma y with epsilon. Mm -hmm. And since we change the function to a data driven function, which is a training data based function, we also took the expectation of expected training data. That's only two differences from before. Okay. We just tag down additional expectation because you can't just leave it as a random object, random number. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, you will, you will not do this bias and see. I mean, this is just understand the concept of the issues of choosing K and so on. But uh, again, we are doing this to calculate the K value, to know our K value. By itself, so we will see the calculation in the second part, where we will not use bias valence instead of at the back of our mind. We will do something like cross validation. You might have already seen that uh, somewhere. Uh, so we will, we will discuss cross validation to choose the value of K. No, we don't know how practically we use it. So. Cross validation is, is the most practical thing you will get from this class. Uh, this is just for understanding that, yeah, that your model is actually a random function of your training data. If your training data changes, right. your, your F hat changes, right? So we are just understanding the statistics of that. You uh, said in the standard format of GT, yeah. you will two things. The first one of the two fix x equal to 0. And what is the second thing? No, fix x equal to 0 and uh, assume the, this model. Like here in the definition of GT, no model is assumed. Right? This is just for any joint distribution of x and y. Mm -hmm. I am just taking x and x is equal x naught and assuming this model. Okay. And before this this model, there is only one random object, which is x naught. That's why I changed the subset to x naught. Okay. Okay. So instead of writing p of x naught y, I just said, I could have written p of x naught, just to make it a little bit That's one change. Now the second change is this ep was for some fixed function f1, hmm. but now I am going to replace that fixed function with a function that depends on training data. Okay. And training data can be random. I am going to think of training data to be random, and therefore I am taking an expectation of this to be training data. That's why it's fine. I am adding one more expectation operation there because one of the objects is random now. It's not fixed f1, uh, it's fixed function. So, so the condition on the training random is the same there is not a so you could just go back to the first definition. Random is in the training of 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 the training
Okay, it is C minus F hat of uh, X hat. Actually, if you remember, I just said there are three terms here: one, two, and three. Uh, the second term, I just substituted the value of C, and there was an expectation I just left, right? So that expectation I just put it in front of it, and that just looks like a definition of a variance. Okay. Think of C. C. I chose C to be the expectation of F hat, and you have F hat. So F hat minus expectation of F hat squared is like a variance definition. Yeah, that's why it's called a variance. There's nothing other, no other reason why it's called a variance. These are semantic labels that you associate with the models. So P2 is kind of the clearest one. I left out the square term here, but it so happens that the expectations cancel out, so this term is zero. Uh, so P3 is kind of zero actually. And uh, P1 uh, just splits into an additive square here, like a uh, sigma square, and then there is this uh, uh, bias. This is called the bias. Okay? P1 was again split into two parts, so this part is called the bias. There is an additive sigma square, and again this this term cancels out, uh, which I have not shown here, but it cancels out. Uh, so, so in this equation, for every train data, yeah. get an F hat yeah. and take average of all sides of train data. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then F of C is the uh, predictive model, like uh, the new value we are getting. No, F of C is the ground truth that you don't have access to, but yeah, F of X is the right prediction that you are supposed to make. And then, uh, epsilon will be the error in that error. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, okay. So, that's why we are subtracting the training model from the predictive model so yeah. that to have a bias. Yeah, yeah. So, bias is just saying how far are you from the right number that you are supposed to predict. Yeah. Because epsilon cannot ever predict. Right? The only thing that you can predict is f of x now. And how far are you from f of x now? Even if you take average of all the things. Because you've already averaged, so why doesn't it depend on tau? Why doesn't it depend on tau? 
and this time also doesn't depend on code because I already taken that. It's like a constant. It's a constant, yeah. That's why you survive the yeah. 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 so, I mean, uh, Can we take a three variables of data set and we can explain this? Bias variants? Uh, like, yeah, let's just three values. Well. There's yeah. three columns, three rows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so then we can, when after doing it in the data set, yeah, yeah, yeah. we can know how to actually take those into the other uh, well sort. This is not for practical use, but we, I'll try to, I'll try to uh, come with an example, but let's, let's try to go for it. to random variables easily because you know for random variable there's a distribution you can always define a variance that's that's very straightforward but to ascribe a notion of variance to a model that requires a little bit of more you know calculation that's what we're trying to do and why do we care about variance of a model uh, because we will say something about the bias and variance of a linear model and the bias and variance of a knn okay uh, So if you remember I just had expanded the term 1 uh, from which I got you know three terms and one of the terms is sigma square which is expectation of epsilon uh, sorry the variance of epsilon epsilon is a zero mean random variable uh, the second term you know one of the terms doesn't depend on epsilon the other term just depends on epsilon so the expectation of epsilon is zero so the second term is zero and the last term uh, doesn't uh, yeah doesn't depend on epsilon, uh, but it's a square of the difference between the true model, which is f of x naught. So f is not known to you. I mean, we are just assuming there is a true model f f, but using Turing data, you don't know that model. Okay. So we are just asking if I had very very different versions of Turing data, I could take an average, which is that c term there. How would it differ from the true uh, model f of x naught? So that is why it's called a bias. The bias is like even even if you're taking average over all sorts of training data, all different realizations training data, you will still not be able to maybe what you're estimating is different from f of x naught. Okay, so that's that's why it's called a, I mean under the square term that's why it's called bias square. But bias is just a term inside. Okay, the difference between f of x naught and c. Okay, is is it's a non-random quantity? f of x naught is not random. C is not random. It's just asking what is the difference between two numbers, and that difference is called a bias. And the square of uh, and there's a square there, therefore it's called a bias square. Okay. 
and uh, what I'll try to do because a lot of people seem to be confused on this topic, I will not substitute QNN or linear regression in this expressions of bias and variance because that would take away. Uh, so we want to continue with linear regression uh, with some example that I have and uh, some extensions of linear regression. Uh, yeah, if there is time, if, if there is time, we'll get back to bias and variance again uh, later. Okay. Uh, but so what we have discussed so far is just that for any model f hat derived from data, okay, uh, the EP at x naught for that model, okay is gonna split into okay and I'm gonna for this I'm gonna say let's let's say y is equal to f of x plus epsilon for this additive model where epsilon is now variance of epsilon is sigma square I'm gonna say this is sigma square plus bias square plus variance of f of f hat okay that's all I wanted to get to okay when I say for any model, I have not really substituted the model expression. I mean, although I did define KNN you know, towards the beginning of the class, let's abandon that trajectory. Uh, for any model F has, whether it's linear regression, KNN, think of any other models that you know of or will learn later, you can substitute any F hat. Uh, that F hat will have a variance with respect to the training data. Uh, there's going to be a bias, which is, the, which is uh, we just saw the bias expression uh, earlier, right? It's, it's F of x naught minus expectation over the training data of f hat of x naught. Uh, there's a square, so there's a square here. Okay. And the sigma square is uh, something that you cannot ever reduce because there's always error in, in, because, of the mo because in, in your model there's always some noise or some randomness. You cannot predict that randomness. Okay, You cannot uh, remove that randomness. There's always going to be some prediction error because of uh, this epsilon. Okay, So that's the first term. Okay. So this is true for any model, for this, any prediction model, for this description of the data, that y is equal to f of x, where f is a true f, uh, y f, f is a true f, and there is an additive randomness, and x is uh, not random. Okay. I, I think I skipped one term here, which is term, term 3 and uh, I will leave it as an enough to show that this is zero. Uh, uh, or we can discuss it uh, during office hours, it's not a big deal. Uh, but I didn't want to you know, s scare you guys with uh, a lot of derivation. Uh, what I was hoping for is to substitute uh, for this I've had a KNN model and a linear model and show how, the, how you can actually compute the bias and variance. But let's uh, defer it uh, you know, uh, for later. Because in practice, what you'll actually do to choose K is what I'm going to discuss pretty soon, and that's called uh, cross validation. So we'll get to cross validation. So if you did not understand much of the first part of this lecture, it's okay. <laughs> Just understand that f hat is an object that depends on training data, so you need to understand the variance of f hat. That's the only conceptual jump here. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's uh, actually jump forward. Uh, okay. Okay. So let's actually, uh, you know, we did too many abstract things, so let's get back to an example. Uh, so on, uh, so in section 2.2 of your notes, uh, I describe, I'm going to flash the, you know, corresponding diagrams. Uh, uh, so in, in section 2.2, I, I, we have a particular data set, uh, which is called the uh, prostate cancer data set. Okay. So now we're going to switch gears and focus again on the linear regression uh, uh, discussion that we had towards the end of last lecture. In the end of last lecture, if you remember, I don't want to rewrite the formula again and again, but there was this beta hat, which was a function of the matrix X and the vector version of y, right? Some function. Okay, I don't want to use f again to confuse. Let's call it some function z. You know, x, x transpose x inverse x transpose y. That is a function. 
But anyway, this is the closed form expression for the linear regression coefficients, right? Now we're gonna just discuss, you know, what does coefficients mean? Are they, you know, significant and so on uh, in the context of an example? So uh, the perfect answer uh, data set is a very small data set. I think it's, it has uh, uh, about 97 observations. And uh, yeah, it looks like they have yeah, they have eight uh, uh, dimensional features. Okay, uh, and they just wanna. Predict uh, dependent variable uh, or the uh, output variable y. Uh, there are some names for these variables. Uh, I don't know how relevant it is for us. Uh, so, so anyway, it's nice on observations. Uh, eight dimensional features x is so x is eight dimensional. Y is one dimensional. Okay. Uh, so first thing uh, in this example that that uh, I've written in the notes. Uh, what they do is first they look at uh, the uh, correlation between x capital X subscript J and capital X subscript you know let me use I okay anyway capital X represents the J coordinate of the input variable right so just uh, we are just asking for the uh, correlation between these two uh, coordinates. Okay. Uh, so, does everybody know how to compute correlation from from a given uh, data? So, who doesn't know what is correlation? It's okay. I mean, let's discuss it. Somebody doesn't recall what correlation is. It's fine. So, everybody is fine with correlation. Yeah, so for two random variables x and y, I mean, let's not talk about these coordinates. For, okay, let, let me use uh, for two random variables z and w. So correlation between uh, z and w is just the expectation of z minus uh, expectation of z times uh, w minus the expectation of uh, w. Uh, that's the covariance, and you just need to divide it by the uh, okay, so when I write subscript, the you know the line distributions of C and W, um, yeah, uh, and okay, let me just put proportionality. So, so the covariance, is, the covariance between two random variables is this, and correlation is just a normalized version of that. Okay, normalized means just divide by the variance of Z and the variance of, um, uh, sorry. Square root of the variance of z and square root of the variance of uh, w. Okay, so this is this should be familiar to you. This is very similar to variance of z, which is just uh, z minus expectation of z times z minus expectation of z. Instead, the second term just has w minus expectation of w. That's all. That's why it's called a covariance. And correlation is proportional to this. Uh, this is actually the co co uh, covariance. And correlation just a, it's just divided by some uh, other numbers. Okay, I don't want to spend too much time on that. Uh, this is similar to variance of z if you just substitute w to the z itself. Okay, this is yeah. Is that clear? Okay. Uh, so So, so here they are just plotting the uh, uh, correlation values. Okay. So, so very quick, uh, you know, redundancy check. Why, why are there some numbers missing? Like, why is there no number for uh, S, Y, and age, for example? Yeah. So you should notice that correlation is a 
symmetric function. So it doesn't matter whether you say correlation of z comma w or w comma z. Okay. Uh, so I didn't expand the names of the uh, predictor variables here or independent variables, uh, but these are these have some relevant uh, names here that I've written. Uh, for example, L C A vol is the log cancer uh, volume. So so there are different interpretation for these prediction predictor variables. Okay. Uh, Fitting the linear regression part is quite uh, easy uh, because we have a closed form expression for beta hat, right? So you can compute beta hat either set to multiply matrices and invert matrices, okay? Um, using the data, which is arranged as rows of a uh, uh, X matrix. Uh, Yeah, actually, the scatter plot for this data set is also shown. Oops. Yeah, so it's just uh, drawing the uh, relations between uh, the different uh, variables. The variable names are given again in in the diagonals here. So you can just eyeball, you know, which uh, coordinates, input feature coordinates are co-varying with each other basically. Um, I think LPSA is the output or dependent variable so they have also plotted uh, how the output variable depends on uh, the input variable. So you can see for example there seems to be some very nice linear relationship uh, between LPSA from L LCA wall because like if LPSA is small maybe LCA wall is also small. Okay. So that's just for eyeballing. Uh, okay, and there seems to be also LCP, which seems to be, which seems to have some trend, maybe. Uh, okay. So, so for this uh, data set, uh, so the way you proceed with this data set, and I think you've done it in your uh, in your assignments as well, is you could probably look at correlations like the scatter plots. You could compute correlations uh, and then get an idea of which which coordinates are important, which coordinates are probably not important. Okay, that's just qualitative at this point. Then let's fix ourselves to linear models. There is nothing really to uh, a kind of uh, tune there. You have a closed form expression. Compute beta hats. Okay, uh, in this at least in this exercise with this data set, and then uh, you need a you need to kind of, uh, you know, um, estimate the prediction error of the model beta hat. Okay, so that's the step. Which so because in linear regression there's nothing to tune. You just get, you know, you solve the formula. You get a model. Now you want to use the model to estimate what is the prediction accuracy of uh, this model. Okay, you you have a one single model. There is no variance from bias stuff here. One single model. You just want to estimate what its what its prediction accuracy is. Okay, uh, and we will focus on how to uh, get to this number uh, uh, now. Okay, so any questions so far? So I've kind of. So I stepped the process of, you know, I started with data, but then I said the next steps are kind of straightforward because we're looking at linear regression, and then let's focus on just uh, just getting a number for a prediction accuracy, right? Um, Because there is uh, nothing to tune, uh, the first strategy is as follows. I'm going to describe two strategies in this uh, in this lecture. Yeah. So, uh, are we going to see, uh, 
So you use so I said you had 90 data points. You broke it into 67 and 30 in this example. Okay, 30 is your test data that let's say your manager keeps. Okay, he's not going to give that data to you. Let's say he or she, and uh, you just want to provide a model f hat. In this case, a linear model. Uh, okay. Uh, f hat is just beta hat transpose x, right? That's your model. Uh, I just wanna give that beta hat to my manager, and uh, before giving that beta hat to my manager, I need to kind of uh, ensure that I'm not uh, uh, overfitting to my data. In the sense, if I have 10 data points and uh, if I have uh, 10 degrees of freedom in my model, then I can fit the fit everything uh, correctly. In the sense, I can have zero error. Okay. Uh, Let's just figure it. I, I just gave you a very uh, um, crude example. All I'm saying is, you need to hedge yourself against uh, overfitting or underfitting, uh, and so that's why you want to get an estimate of prediction error. But you you're not accessing test data. Okay, test data. Your manager will do something with the final model that you get. Uh, you have the 67 points. Maybe with the 67 points, you want to fit the model, like compute the beta hat, and also get a score for how well the model does. Uh, so let's let's say strategy zero is just you can just report the residual sum of squares for that model. Okay. You had the you computed the model. You can just use the same model on the training data and compute the residue, you know, the errors and just report that. Okay, that's the sum of square errors, right? That's one strategy, but that strategy is bad because you are actually using the same data to evaluate or uh, 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 score your model. Okay, uh, so I guess strategy one is going to be okay. I have 67 uh, data points. Let me break that again into two parts, and I'll call one part validation, validation set, and the other part I'll call it. I mean, it's already called training data, so part of the training data, I guess. Okay. And so I'll only use this part of the training data to compute beta hat. You know, linear regression just compute the you know we have the formula, and then use the validation set to kind of get a number of how how this uh, uh, model is performing. Okay, that's just for you to know what you're doing. Okay, uh, because there is no tuning in in the vanilla version of least squares, there's really nothing you can do. <laughs> I, I mean, given this so, what we have seen so far. Uh, uh, yeah. So this is a this is. So you just held out some set for yourself uh, from the training data that you are given, and you are scoring your model uh, with respect to that. So at least your beta hat. Is not uh, is not derived from this validation set. Okay. Uh, start in strategy zero, you use all your training data to compute beta hat. Test. test is anyway. It's not with you, so you can kind of ignore that from you know in your consideration. Okay. So yeah, just you have training data. You can always compute a model, but then if you compute the model using the whole training data. How do you know it's a good model, right? Maybe you just have an internal partition of your training data into two parts: a validation part and a, a part of the training data, whatever remaining part. And then you only get some model from the remaining part, and then maybe score it against this uh, validation set that you kept aside for yourself. And maybe that gives you a number of how the model is performing. Because at least you did not use that validation data for your own uh, uh, for building the model, like defining the model, right? So when they are going about partitioning the data, like yeah. Because since this is small, it doesn't seem. Yeah, it's very small. Yes. So uh, I mean, is there, I mean, is there any kind of limitation that we should have partitioning the data in terms of training and validation? Just to uh, require all the information that we could possibly get. Uh. Yeah, it's a good concern that this is small data, so it's not clear if. Each of these sets, you know, let's not be concerned with the test set. Uh, maybe somebody else partitioned it nicely. Uh, but the way you partition your own training data, maybe the validation set is not similar to your uh, remaining part of the training data. Yeah, that can happen. And so it's still a design choice of how do you break 
uh, data into two parts. Yeah. Um, there is concern, but we will not go into the details here. Um, yeah. No, but then uh, that's like uh, so you should not use test data for anything other than scoring the final thing that you're confident about. Uh, which means that it's as good as saying my manager has a test data and I'll, I'll give one model which I think is the right model here and the manager will score it. Okay. Um, so this validation set is supposed to uh, help you uh, with this proxy of the test data, actually. Okay. Uh, so I just said, okay, let's have validation data and let's get a score for how the linear regression performs. But what are we going to do with that? Okay, let's say linear regression performs well, uh, maybe it doesn't perform well, okay, in terms of uh, what the estimate, error estimate. Uh, what can you do? Okay, so that is where we're going to introduce a couple of techniques. One of them is called uh, uh, subset selection. And the uh, idea here is we're going to drop some of the input variables. Okay, if we have 10 dimensional x, Maybe we want to just have a five dimensional x. Okay. So, so this is our raw input variables. We want to only want to have five uh, input variables relevant to us. Okay. I mean, five is I just said a random number, but we'll see, figure out how to pick, you know, the uh, uh, input variables that are, that are relevant to our prediction. Okay. Uh, the second thing uh, we can do is. Also, you know, this this seems to be uh, like a really sharp cutoff. I'm dropping a bunch of variables that I have already measured, right? These coordinates that I have already measured. So maybe we can do some sort of a uh, softer, I guess, version of subset selection. And these are called uh, first method is called ridge regression. Our second method uh, is called uh, lasso. Okay. So the story is we have this validation data. We scored our original linear regression. Okay, we got some number. Maybe we want to include that number. And so now we were thinking of dropping some of our uh, uh, input variable coordinates. So how many to drop? Uh, we're not sure. So uh, that's uh, that's what we're going to discuss first, and then there's a, instead of actually completely dropping off the measurements that we took, maybe there's some way to still retain those uh, coordinates, uh, but still uh, uh, potentially improve our uh, prediction performance. Okay, so that's the ridge regression and lasso technique, and and so all the, these guys are trying to do is we're not happy with linear regression, let's do something still in the linear model space, but some extensions, okay? That's the story. Uh, and and, and you'll see that each of these methods will have a choice, okay? Uh, what is the choice? In subset selection, the question is how many, uh, so as I said, uh, let's say input dimension is 10, how many dimensions should you actually retain in your, in your prediction model, okay? Is it one or two or five? or all 10, okay? There's a choice now. There's an additional choice that you need to pick, okay? Similarly, in ridge regression and lasso, I'll, I'll define them pretty soon, uh, you will have some choices to make, okay? The moment you introduce choice, uh, validation set now becomes relevant. You can score your model for a given choice on your validation set, and then see what the performance is, and change your choice, see again the score on the validation set, uh, uh, maybe it's better or low, then again change the choice and so on. So that's why validation set makes sense when you have choices to make. Okay. Uh, okay, so what is subset selection? It's a very uh, straightforward technique uh, where, let's say, as I said, p, our x is p dimensional. Let's consider all subsets of our, of our, of, of, of our features. Okay. So how many subsets can there be? Okay. Uh, let's say it's x1, x2, and x3 are the three coordinates of my are the three coordinates of my uh, input variable, right? Three-dimensional variable, p is equal to three k. 
then you know the word subset just means you know I'm going to retain just the variable one, maybe in in one more one setting, maybe only variable one is enough to kind of make a prediction for uh, the dependent variable uh, output variable y. y. Um, so maybe the other subsets are x2 and x3, you know. Y, y, x1, you can have these other options. And similarly, you can have x1, x2. x1, x3. x2, x3. Or, you know, I don't want to really, uh, really, maybe you realize that you don't want to really subset anything, so it's x1, x2, and x3. Okay. So these are all the possibilities that you could do uh, to, uh, you know, move away from linear regression. So actually this would just give you the same linear regression coefficient, but uh, uh, linear regression model. But here you have different, mo different models because first of all you're changing dimensions and it's not the same features anymore. I mean, it's a, it's a reduced set of features, right? So one thing is for each one you could have a beta hat, right? I mean, this one is the original, I guess. Right? And once you construct this model, so you would want to construct it on the part of a training data, and maybe use strategy one, and you you know just code these models with uh, uh, that validation data. And then pick the model which has the lowest validation score. Okay, and then you can just give that model to your manager, right? Uh, is this is this clear? That's all. Subset selection is just this. You know, if you've heard this term before. Uh, and there is a slight trick uh, that that I talk about in the notes, where you know if you consider all subsets, so for three. Uh, Three uh, uh, input coordinates. How many subsets are there? Seven, right? For three, so you can verify that the general formula is true to the power p minus one. Okay. Uh, I mean, this is just counting the number of subsets. Okay. So if you really wanted to do subset selection, you wanna check for every one of these subsets how is in the corresponding beta hat doing on the validation set and then pick the correct one. And so you're really like like so P is ten, what is two to the power ten? Thousand twenty four. Okay. Uh, so you thousand twenty three models which all need to be evaluated and then you wanna look at which model is the one which has the lowest validation score and that maybe that one uh, is the one you pick. Okay. So there's a lot of effort needed. And so there is a Slight shortcut, uh, which is which is which is a shortcut, and therefore it's not gonna explore all the two to the power p minus one um, options or choices. Okay, and um, the shortcut is you start with no. Uh, so okay, uh, I'll just call it greedy subset selection heuristic. I think in the notes I just call it uh, forward. Oh, I don't even call it any name. Uh, it's called strategy two in the notes. But uh, so all, all I'm saying is let's let's pick. Uh, let's start with no uh, variables. Okay, and I'm just gonna find. Uh, so when there are no variables, how I'm gonna so I'm gonna predict y using constant, which means that I just want to know what is the mean of uh, the output. Okay? When there is no input variable to use for predicting y, then the only thing you can predict is the mean value of your train data. Okay? Sorry. Uh, and then I'm going to first look at, you know, let me put x1, x2, and x3, okay? and see the corresponding, uh, you know, uh, validation errors. And then pick one of them. Let's say I pick x1. Okay. 
Sir. So step zero. So I'll tell you why this is called in video. So step zero, we start with the so remember in the original setting, subset selection, I need to check for every subset. As many subsets, okay? Instead of that, what I'm gonna do is start with no variables. Just uh, you know actually this step one is not even needed. So let's say I start with step two. Okay. Step one is kind of irrelevant to me. Yeah, really. Uh, so we start with step two, which is consider each of the uh, variables. Okay, there are only three variables in this example. Uh, so just to just regress y on x1, on x2, on x3. Okay. In a sense, consider the single subset version of the problem. Pick one of them. Okay, and then always and then this is going to be in your solution. Okay, is a part of your final uh, model. Okay, so the the x one with the lowest uh, validation error is going to be part of your final model, and then x one is fixed. The only two other options are x two and x three. Okay, then you use uh, x one is fixed for both of them. Okay, try x two and x three and get the validation errors. So when I say y on something, all I'm saying is build a build a linear regression model with y as the dependent variable or the output variable and x1 and x2 as the uh, independent variable. So you get a validation error, two numbers here. Pick one of them, which other is the lowest? Let's say x1 and x2. Okay. And that's it. So after this, there's only one other set. You know, once you pick x1 and x3, a fix the only other option. Is uh, x2 okay? So, so how is this different from what I said earlier? Considering every subset, it's just that uh, the difference is that you're greedily adding one coordinate. One coordinate feature at a time, and we are never removing them. That's why I'm using the word greedy here. Um, it's just colloquially, yeah. It's just saying that you start with, uh, you know, you try every variable once, pick the variable which has the lowest error, you know, uh, with just in the one variable version of the problem. Just always keep that variable, and now we're just asking for the remaining p minus one variables, or in this case two variables. Which one should I add next? Well, and then you get two. And then you add one more in the p minus two variables, p minus three variables, and so on. So there's only at most p stages involved here. Okay. Uh, so then we said that's a good question. There's still choice in the sense, just like before, there are so many models, uh, so many different models. You could get the best one. Similarly here, let's say you go all the way to the p, uh, all the way to p, then you exhausted all the models. Then you have exhausted all the sorry input coordinates. Then you have how many model candidates do you have? You actually have at every stage consider that as a model candidate. So you have p model candidates. Now you look at the validation errors and pick the one with the lowest value. Okay. So every stage and uh, so here when you pick x1, there is a corresponding beta hat. When you pick x3, there is a corresponding beta hat. Okay. And and at the last stage in this example, there is a corresponding beta hat. Okay. There are three guys here. Uh, these three, you just compare the validation errors, and whichever one is there, just just that's your subject. Yeah. Basically, the strategy of computing more with the number of numbers. Yeah. In the second one, I'm trying to reduce the computing. Yeah. Yeah. So the one, the upper one, will be more uh, have more variance. Yeah, but let's not go into variance. <laughs> and, but, okay. Because model variance we did not discuss in specific, right? We just discussed the general models we discussed, yeah. But how is, I mean, is the only computation, how are the only parameter, how these two are just with each other or No, I mean, so the second step, since I'm going, you know, adding one variable at a time and never removing them, the number of things that I'm considering is not too many. Number of sets that I'm considering is not too many, right? Uh, in fact, 
IIT controller, it's just uh, total number of sites I consider is just p square or something, order p square. Whereas in the first version, the number of sites is 2 to the power p. Okay, there's a big difference. Uh, but if you have that model, you would expect to see if only would have a lower dimension in the end. Yes, yes. So we are now, so the moment we picked x1 always to be in our uh, final, uh, spinal model, yeah, x2, x3 may, might have been the best one. You kind of are not getting to that. Yeah. Yeah. So there's computation advantage. Uh, yeah, so if P is 10 or 20, uh, you have to compare, you know, a uh, thousand or a million models, you know, just for linear regression. So maybe the second one is, P, yeah, it's a design choice. So these are choices that you need to make uh, if you want to do more than just linear regression. So uh, remember, premise was that we have a baseline which is just linear regression. We have a closed form expression for that. We can get a validation error. Now, our, our subsequent questions are how do we improve by either dropping uh, some coordinates, maybe some coordinates are really useless, um, or, or doing something else. So we are introducing, uh, vaguely, you know, uh, subjectively speaking, we are introducing bias. We are restricting uh, the uh, set of models that we want to consider. Okay. So, yeah. No, no, no. So we, we are not. Uh, so let's say in the last case we consider all three variables, uh, but there could be a different setting. Like so let's say x1 and x3 that would have lower validation error. Then that would be a model. So, so validation error is the only way you can con you you are you are scoring all these different models. So so linearization will give you one model, right? That's that considers all input features, right? But maybe by doing this uh, subset selection or kind of removing some of these uh, input features, you may get a different model. So it's called a different model because now you have different number of coordinates, right? It's not no more a p-dimensional regression problem. It's a let's say in this case it's a two-dimensional regression problem. You have a different coefficients, right? So you're just uh, you're asking why is this an improvement, yeah. right? I'm not saying it's an improvement. The improvement is data driven. The improvement is only scored by the validation error. So it could always, it could be the case that, so okay, I guess I'll tell you why it, it uh, may not be an improvement. So there, there's a wrong intuition, which is if you have more variables, then you will always have lower residual sum of squares. So the linear regression will always have lower residual sum of squares than if you remove some of the uh, input variables. Okay. That's because you have more degrees of freedom in the full linear regression. Okay. So by dropping your some some of your coordinates, which is what we're doing here, the rest of your sum of squares on your training data will be worse. Okay, you will always do worse than linear regression. But on the validation data, it's not clear whether linear regression is gonna perform better than uh, this subset selection process the choice, you know, model choice. So Whether adding the same coordinate, yeah, increase your condition error, and based on that choice, it will it will always okay validation error, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you if you only consider training error, it will always decrease, but validation error may increase or decrease. Yes, yes. Isn't that equivalent to just simulating zero data? No, uh, we are not doing simple regression here. Uh, well, like explaining a variable, is it the same as saying it's the uh, is zero? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. So let's say we, it so happened that out of these three models, the, the second model where we draw x2 is the best in terms of validation error. All that me means is that we said beta x2 is equal to zero. Beta hat x2 is equal to zero. Uh, beta hat 2 is equal to zero, sorry. Yeah. Right? I mean. So that's subset selection. Yeah. So now we're getting, uh, you know, away from statistics a little bit, but we'll get back to statistics soon. Yeah. Is this the same thing as forward and backwards stepwise selection that we do? Yeah, yeah. So this greedy procedure that I talked about, uh, it has a, you know, some people call it forward stepwise uh, regression, I guess. Forward stepwise, sorry, forward stepwise subset selection, I guess. Is there any uh, 
Uh, I have not introduced backward selection in this lecture. Uh, neither have I introduced some other things. So all I'm saying is, so let's let's just appreciate the problem, right? You have linear regression model, and all we're saying is, can we draw some coordinates and do better in our validation set? Okay. Uh, so if you had enough time, uh, then let's say like, you know, if you had enough resources, then you just search for all subsets, you know, score all subsets and get one subs some subset which would be the best in terms of validation model, right? It's just that the, this, this forward greedy trick that I just described is just so that, you know, you don't have time to score all the thousand models, let's say in 10 dimensional example, uh, thousand, you know, 1023 models, then you can do some greedy procedure. Now, it's not clear whether doing exhaustively versus doing uh, this greedy procedure versus doing some other procedures is going to get you the best model. So there is still design choice there. Here I have just told you two, two options. One is for every subset give me a score on the validation data and the second option is go stepwise, uh, add one coordinate at a time, get a score and just take the model with the lowest score in terms of validation among these models. Those are the only two I have you know, described. But you can imagine very you know, exotic ways or other fancy ways to remove your uh, uh, coordinates, right? Info, info coordinates. You can always do that. Yeah. Because you are not touching any of your test data. All, everything that you are playing with is uh, a part of the training data and you can also kind of score them with the separate held up validation that you have. Yeah, you had a question? Ah. Yeah, so after like, we drop the variables and we get a good validation score, how yeah. is it? It's still a good model. Yeah, so because the validation score is, yes, yes, so, <laughs> yeah, that's right, so we moved away from size 6, so this validation score is an uh, approximation for your test score, uh, sorry, for, for your EPE. So EPE of F, if you remember, is, uh, let's say we are looking at squared error, okay, so this validation scoring uh, is, a, is an empirical or a, is a data-driven number, estimate, it's, a, it's an estimate of your EPE. So you don't have access to EPE because you don't know the joint distribution. Okay, you're only being given data. I split the data into two parts. Uh, in my training data, I just split one part into a validation net data. That part is just uh, giving me an estimate of the EPE, which uh, you know, which I don't, I cannot compute directly because I don't have a joint distribution because I don't know how data is generated. And considering all the attributes and calculating my EPE, how so the question is, why, by dropping variables, they may do worse. Yeah. Uh, be, so, so there are two statements, right? You do all the attributes and yeah. you're calculating your beta. Yeah, so yeah. That's the complete thing that you're doing. Now you're dropping the variables and you're calculating beta. Yeah. So because we don't know, so for example, let me, uh, let's say in the prostate uh, cancer example data set, there are eight features here. Let's say I add another ninth feature, which is the color of the shoe of the person. Who, who went to the diagnostic, okay? That's another feature, right? Whether a feature is useful for predicting uh, LPS or whatever is a dependent variable there uh, is questionable. So so it may make sense to drop it. Like if you go through this procedure, you, may, you will try to drop it. So it's not clear that all the all the measurements that you make of the input variable are actually useful to make a, uh, is, is, is related to the uh, output variable, right? So the worst case, it will give me a same no, it's not necessary, right? If you have more degrees of freedom, you can fit your training data more uh, and better. So that's why, first of all, we said let's not score on training data, which is the residual sum of scores. Uh, sum of scores. Let's score on validation data. And they may not be the same. I mean, there is no relation there, right? Depending on the true derivation process, it could be that your independent variable is only dependent on the first coordinate of your input variable, okay? That means that Unless you get to that model, like identify that y is only related to x1 and not x1, x2, x3, x4, uh, you will be off, right? Yeah. So that's the struggle with uh, dealing with data, that you don't know what the joint distribution of x and y is. If you know what the joint distribution is, we don't have to do all this. Okay. Uh, okay. So success selection is quite straightforward and simple. Okay. Uh, but now I'm gonna 
put success selection in the context of a different strategy for scoring your model. Okay. So previously I said we have uh, 90 data points. Uh, we had 67. In this example, so happens that they had they split it into 67 and 30. So, okay. Uh, 30 is with your manager, so you really don't have access to those observations and the uh, and the labels. Like basically, it's equivalent to zip dot test. Okay, in your uh, assignment one uh, data set. Now, the 67. We said one strategy was to break the uh, 67 observations into two parts, one validation uh, set and one uh, remaining part of the training data. And here is the valid question: you know, how do you know that the you know the validation set is capturing all you know variabilities, all nuances of the of, of the your data distribution, right? Uh, for example, you may uh, in your validation set you only have all excess all exponents being some very small values, you know, that doesn't correspond to your training data or your test data, things like that. Especially with small data, it's a problem. Uh, so I'm going to suggest another strategy to estimate uh, EPE, you know. And that's why I guess they're, um, they're using the word validation, I guess, validation using an estimate of the, by estimating EPE, okay. Um, I think this is strategy 2, right? I think I use strategy 0, 1. Let's call this 2. Uh, this is uh, popularly called uh, cross validation. Okay. Here, we're not going to split. So, in strategy 1, I said, I, I said uh, split 67 into two parts. So this is seven training data points into two parts, and just use the second part as a validation, you know, as an estimate of the ETE. Right? Uh, in strategy two, uh, this strategy two is on is on section three point one point one in the notes. Uh, we're not going to split our data into two parts: uh, remaining part of the training data and the validation set. We're not going to do that. Okay? We're going to do slightly complicated maneuvering, but it's still going to give me an estimate of my EP, okay, which is the expected square prediction error, assuming square loss, you know, let's assume linear regression model, same, same setting as the linear regression, okay, same square loss thing. Uh, so, so just remember that we're doing validation, cross-validation because we have multiple models. Because we, because we're doing subset selection. If we are just doing linear regression, there's nothing to choose there. Right? Okay. Just a consistency check. Uh, okay. So what is cross validation? Uh, so cross validation is as follows. Again, there is some choice involved here. Let's. We have to choose something. So let's say we choose uh, ten as a number. Okay. So. The ten, uh, if it is a number, then it's called uh, it's it corresponds to something called folds. Okay, so when you choose a number, it's called uh, then the cross validation procedure is parameterized by, by that number, and it's called uh, tenfold cross validation. Okay. Okay. What is the objective of this procedure? Just to recall, the objective is to estimate. Estimate EP for F, uh, a model F, or uh, I guess a pet, uh, whichever model you pick. Okay. I just need a score for anything that you want to figure out. Okay. And what does it entail? It's going to break your, uh, so I'm going to represent the training data into as a box. Okay. And I'm going to break the box into 10 parts. I don't know what to do. Okay, so there are 10 parts here. So what do you mean by, uh, so what is this definition? By by boxes I mean, let's think of, uh, there is, uh, yeah. Let's say this box has six observations, this box has six observations, this box has six observations, and so on, okay. Maybe that's only accounts for 60, but we have 67 in this example, but that's okay. Uh, and then, 
what we'll do is uh, so we have 10 boxes so we'll do for each box okay this box I guess I'm calling it a box but a fold we also call folds okay buckets box folds containers whatever for each box um, get a model using all other folds which means that let's pick the first box to be you know the current box under consideration then use everything else to come up with a beta hat so it's very similar to the strategy one where I had a separate validation set that I use everything else to come up with a beta hat so same thing here except that the everything else is still broken down into folds but that's okay so get a model using all other folds okay and then score this model using the current fold or box whatever so let's say I pick the first box so uh, uh, then I use uh, all of the boxes to com compute a model okay and then I use that model uh, I score that model using this uh, first box so when I say score um, precisely all I'm saying is compute 1 by so if you remember let's do a sum of squares expression is just 1 by so whatever the size of the box let's say the box has m elements uh, sorry m observations here in this example 6 is just the sum of y i minus um, whatever model that I built from the other boxes of x i okay then y i and x i are just the uh, observations in this box okay so this is all I mean by uh, sorry square score that model okay this model is built using other boxes other folds okay so you got the score so uh, so you re remember that score actually the thing I guess now you do the same uh, procedure for each different box so you in turn you change the box on which you want to score and compute a potential you know every time you use different uh, different different uh, so let's say now I, I chose this box to be my current box under consideration then I, I use all the other boxes to build another model okay so that model need not be the same as uh, this model that I built in this when I fix the first box okay So uh, all I'm saying is for every box, the focus is on a fixed box, I get a score. At, at the end of this operation, I fix the box, I build the model, I use the model to evaluate on this observation, so I got a, got a number. Okay. I can repeat the whole procedure uh, for every different box. I'll ignore the models, the models will be different from uh, every time, but I'll retain the scores, okay? And then I'll just average those numbers. That's the, uh, so you retain this and then take the average. So after the follow we take uh, that's our estimate of EP. Okay. Uh, but that's our estimate of EP not for a specific model, right? I mean because I, I use very different models in each uh, you know each part of the loop but it's for a specific model choice for example think of uh, the subset selection that we're talking about so there our choice was the number of coordinates that we want to pick right so uh, let's say we wanted to pick two coordinates so it's an estimate of pp for picking two coordinates because that was a choice in subset selection the question is which of the subsets are, am I supposed to use so they are all different choices right for each choice the model itself will be different because I am using different parts of the training data to compute a model right is that confusing or is that clear 
So yeah, so let's ground it in the context of uh, subset selection. Yeah. The scoring uh, is for a model, for a model that I computed using the remaining data. So the model could be, so, so you do this for, so let's say you had a choice, right? You had subset selection choice. So let's say uh, I can choose, uh, uh, you know, uh, I could choose one uh, one uh, input coordinate, I could have chosen two input coordinates, I could have chosen uh, three input coordinates and so on, right? In fact, not just coordinates, I could have specified exactly whether it's x1, x3 that I want to choose, or x1, x2 I want to choose, or x2, x3 I want to choose, right? Let's fix x1, x2 to be the, our choice. For that choice, we're asking what is the error for all the different models I could, that I could get when I change my training data. So so this, this for loop is all it's doing is, let's look at, so this for loop is just repeating the, pro, the validation, the strategy one I was talking about, by uh, by considering every part of the training data as a validation data uh, in turn. So if you remember in strategy one, I said, okay, we have training data, we'll split it into two parts, a validation and everything else. We'll build a model on everything else. Let's say we still have X1 and X2 as a candidate coordinates, okay? We'll build a two-dimensional model there, right? Uh, and then score it on the validation set. Now all I'm saying is, now, now let's forget about again the split between validation and testing. We'll consider some other part to be validation set. Build another model with just x1 and x2 again. On the, it's going to be different data. And so it on a different validation set. Keep on repeating. And this uh, this uh, fills or buckets are just uh, giving us a clear picture of what that means. In the sense, in the first try, I'm going to consider the left you know, leftmost part to be my validation set and everything else to be my training set, build the model, score that with the validation set and then just remember the score, forget the model and now then I'm going to consider the second box or fold to be my validation set, use everything else, all of the data to build a model, score it on this validation set, just return the score, forget the model. Then the third one, again consider that part to be the validation set, this part use all other data to build a model, score that model on the third part, which is the validation data, just remember the score, forget, so just repeat this for 10 times in this case, and just remember those, average the scores. Okay? That's going to be the score for considering x1 and x2 to be the, um, you know, important coordinates in your, in your model. It's a choice, right? So, <laughs> yeah, so, the, huh? No, no, so you're, for every choice, you're getting a final score. And this, after this averaging, you're getting, for every choice, let's say X1 and X2, you get a score, right? So, instead of X1 and X2, maybe you're considering X1 and X3, there's another score. So now you compare these scores and pick the right subset. So it's still the subset selection problem. I just change the, training and validation to this more involved procedure, but all it's trying to do is estimate the expected square prediction error. Even the original split, where you did not consider cross-validation, you're only considering breaking the training data into two parts, uh, right? The validation set, well, all it was doing is estimate EPE, expected square prediction error. Because we don't have job distribution, we have to use data. And we don't want to use data that we also use to build a model. Okay, that's the that's intuition. Is that clear? Okay, so So success selection is not the only place where you need to pick choices, yeah? You can do, uh, you can do anything you want, I mean. <laughs> no, I'm just suggesting a particular way to drop coordinates. You can eyeball using the correlation, you know, scatter plots. And maybe you can quantitatively see or qualitatively come up with a number of, you know, maybe correlation numbers themselves and drop, yeah, that's fine. That would be another procedure. 
it's not clear how it will perform. So you need to think about what are the biases or what are the shortcomings of such a procedure. Here, uh, since you know, at least in the best you know, in the subset selection case, I considered at least in the first selection, I considered all subsets. I'm not really dropping anything, and I'm really directly tying it to the score on uh, the EP. You care about the EP, right? Not really correlations between predictors. Um, so the subset selection to is at least is saying for every subset, I'm getting an estimate of EP. Take the subset which has the lowest EP on the validation data, and that's my model. If you can do that, then it's fine. I mean, you can look at correlation flaws. It's fine. Yeah. 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 No, you ignore the models. I told you, right? So you have ten folds, ten different models, but only from each fold, you only remember the score for the choice of x one and x two. Okay. So I don't have to make any choice this is a problem that I should go ahead and do. You can, you can. Once you know X and X2, you can use the whole data to come up with a final model and just use that model. So here the choice is, see, in linear regression there is no choice. In success selection, the choice is which partners to take. This procedure is just telling you, if you take X and X2, this is the, you know, validation score, okay? But once you, uh, uh, you know, pick the coordinates with the lowest validation score, then you can use your full training data again with this choice and build the final model. You know, there is no ambiguity. But while doing cross validation, don't remember the models is, is the rule of thumb. There is no point. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like we don't have a test, we can make up what we need. Yeah. So we would uh, estimate the value of the cross validation. Yes. And then how do we move on? So, no, so the estimate of AP is needed whenever you have any choice to make. Right. So in linear regression, there was really no choice to make. So if you had a three dimensional input variable and a uh, one dimensional output variable, linear regression would give you a plus form expression using a training data and you just compute the data hat, right? There's really no choice to make. But the moment you are trying to improve um, on that linear regression, still in the linear model space, but now let's say one way of improving it is to drop some coordinates, then you have choices to make, right? Which coordinates to drop and so on. So, so that, is, that is where I'm introducing this notion of validation and cross validation. So every choice that you make, you can come up with a validation score, either using cross validation or using the simple strategy that I talked about earlier. And for every choice, if you have the score, then you pick the choice with the lowest score, okay? And then use that choice, so for example, just using uh, variables uh, coordinates one and two, use that choice to build a linear regression model again, and then, you know, and then just use that model and give it to your manager. In the sense, that is your final model. There is no other, nothing else that you need to do. So you remove your choice by evaluating how each choice does on your validation. Process. What was the strategy 0 and 1? Yeah. There was a model corresponding to There is a model. There is a model here as well, right? So once you make a choice that x1 and x2 are the final, are the right two coordinates to pick, then you can forget our cross-validation and everything else. Just use your whole training data, the whatever you have. Again, do linear regression on just let's say x1 and x2 in this example and use that linear regression model as uh, give it off to your manager. So could I see uh, regarding the cross that it's checking over the consistency of the error that I wrote the given recording instead of the error speaking? So I mean by looking at all parts of the uh, cross validation? Sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it ties back to your question about why, you know, if you split data into two parts, maybe the validation part is not representative. When I say not representative, I'm just being very sub, you know, subject to colloquial here. It doesn't look like the same distribution, for example. But if it doesn't look like the same distribution of it, if your training, validation, and test don't look similar in, in a distributional sense, like the joint distribution sense, then if you fit a model to one, it will not do well on the other. Because the model is, you know, is, is kind of, the data is trying to mimic the joint distribution, right? You don't have access to joint distribution, the data is mimicking that. But if the validation and the t training don't look similar, then, then there's issue. And precisely as you said, uh, cross validation is trying to use every part of your training data as a validation set. And so it's kind of somehow killing this effect of uh, arbitrary choice of a validation set and a non-validation set in training data. Yeah. 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 Y
Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. So basically, you can use consolidation on it to understand what variables to use to build a model, right? No, cross validation, as we will see uh, again and again, is, is the, you can use that to choose something. So every, at any time in any modeling procedure, you have a choice. Okay, like in in, in subset selection, you uh, you have a choice of which two coordinates to pick. You will see later on in some models, like in KNN, you have to pick. Oh, uh, I should have grabbed this up earlier. <laughs> uh, it's lost in a minute, I think. Uh, I guess in KNN, the choice of K, the number of neighbors that you want to use, can also be reduced by doing cross validation. Okay. Anytime you have a choice, in KNN you have a choice of K, in subset selection you have a choice of uh, the, the, the coordinates. How do you pick those coordinates and how do you pick that K? You can do that using validation, right? Yeah, so actually KNN uh, proved that you brought this up. Uh, yeah, KNN is also an example where you can use cross validation. Okay, so uh, that's it for today. Uh, Please come see me if something is not clear because it seems like the first part was uh, because we were averaging our sample data, you know, averaging our data sets, it seemed like different from what we saw before. Yeah. This is a bit, I say a couple more lecture, but it's just like to uh, Z score for beta. Yes, yes, yes. It's a VJ. Uh, this is supposed to be the. Uh, the I Okay. The JJ and here the X rank is the inverse method. It's what she looks like ahead of the So, I love this one, Okay, so in terms of computation, it's a VJ. How would I do that to this one? Is it a sample matrix? A sample matrix, really? Yes. So, so computationally, you've already probably done this. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, you need to multiply the matrices, take the inverse. Uh, right, yeah. So which is what this is. Like, this is actually. Okay, so, okay. okay, so then this is V1 and this is V2. Okay. So it's probably just V1. Uh, I think this is the square and this is the square.
Nobody walks in here like Selection and we do cross validation and then we get a minimum EP. So basically, we have one more. 
So can it be possible that when we uh, use it on the whole data set, like we have a few beta, right? Yeah. And when we use it on the whole data set, we get a much higher EP than we got originally. When, when you use a full training data set to talk with a model, let's say linear regression, how do you get an estimate of EP? Like you don't have an estimate of EP. How do you estimate EP by not using some part of the training data for building the okay, work? What about if we get like a higher... Uh, Are you saying hypothetically it could improve? Yeah, it could, it could increase. Yeah. Hypothetically an EP. So there is the estimate of EP, which is validation, what's validation is doing, and there is the original EP, which you don't have access to. Yeah, I mean doing all this stuff may increase the original EP, which you don't have access to. That's true. Uh, these are just ways to proxy the EP because you don't have a joint distribution. How do you proxy it? By cross validation or you know just splitting your training data into validation set and non validation set. But then you go, go ahead with this model that you have. Yeah, you have. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's the struggle with data, right? You don't have a joint distribution, but if you have a joint distribution, you can do everything nicely. But now you only have data, so you just work with data and hope that the data is representative of the joint distribution. I still have a Yeah. So, in subset selection, you also giving me the best combination of X, of X yeah. Yeah. and cross validation is also giving me the same. No, cross validation is giving me just a score for a choice that you made. You, you make the choice of X on X. That includes subset selection. Yeah, yeah. Within subset selection, cross validation is a subroutine. Mm -hmm. Like, a, so, so if you want to do subset selection, in the stage one, you want to pick X on X to X3. For each one, you have to do cross validation. Mm -hmm. To make a choice of X1, for that you do cross validation to get an estimate of EP. Choose X2, use cross validation to get an estimate of EP. Choose X3 to get an estimate of EP. Then take the minimum of the X1. And then again, the next stage, again, you have to use cross validation to the next choices that you make. The main choices are X2, X3. It's just, I mean, cross validation is high level. So, just to use that.
你只要是什么，刚刚我讲的是那个数据，你再看看，今天的早上三点了，你应该是很多地方都是很累，对吧？我们这边有。One second, one second. Let me just see what the time is. Just, just, I mean, you can, you can, you know, 
I got 10 buckets. You can pick 3 buckets to be uh, your test sound or yeah. sound buckets to be trained. But you have to keep track of what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. It's just a... Oh, so then it's not a mandatory thing that we have. We can only test one bucket, right? No, no. So we have like... Uh, no, but if you come out, if you pick 3 buckets every time, then why do you have higher granularity? Yeah. You can think of the 3 buckets as one bucket, you know? Yeah. Alternative. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
it's it's okay. I mean, we can do everyone do on our test, but I think for the task is just simple. Like what we saw in the two examples, it was just uh, you have two classes, two and three, which are all two and three. I was just asking for NMRs. Yeah, it's like indicator of a single threshold. The other threshold is uh, two or more thresholds. Okay, but I think there is no right answer, so you can only no. Uh, so behind the threshold selection, there is no logic. Yeah, you can devise it. As you said, you suggest something, yeah, you can do so. Okay. Uh, is the only one for today? Yeah, yeah, you should use it. Yeah. Uh, sure, what uh, the only one is the only one? Uh, uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, you uh, oh, no, I don't think so. Oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah, they have some. Yeah, they have some. Yeah, okay. So, so 
another way is I'm just uh, opening the terminal normally. Like I'm not going to that direction. I'm opening the normally, and then it's then it's really moving terminal. I don't understand what's happening. No, that's mean. That means that Keras is not reading some config file when you do, like it's reading the config file or or something in one version and not reading it in another version, something like that, right? I mean, see, Keras is completely determined by some simple text file which says which thing to use. Okay, yeah. Keras is not doing anything more clear than that. So it's just that maybe in one version it's not reading that text file when it starts. So I should continue using this as long as it's working, or do I? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I don't. I don't think it's a big bug. Maybe you can visit me in my office uh, oh, on Monday or Tuesday. Ah, uh, okay. Monday or Tuesday. Monday, uh, Monday is direct from. I, I can't be Monday. I have to complete it today. Although that's why the urgency. Do you have a Do you have a laptop or something? Yes. Do you want to show me what's happening? I mean, do you have time? <laughs> I think I'll go away. I'll go home. So okay, forget it. I mean, I I'll, I'll use what it is. Uh huh. But you want to use TensorFlow, right? Yes, I have to use it. And this is a very simple thing: is that uh, Boston dataset. 